Stanford University. Well, good evening, everybody. The noise level is going up high enough, suggesting it's probably time to get started. I'm not the scheduled speaker for tonight. In fact, I don't know who the scheduled speaker for tonight was supposed to be. Uh, but greetings from Terry Root, who's at a National Academy of Sciences panel meeting in Seattle, and Meg Caldwell, who's on a flight to the Cook Islands. The scheduled speaker couldn't come, so they contacted me late last night and asked if I would come. And so I'm happy to be here. I don't have any slides, and so this is going to be primarily a discussion. You've got two hours of my time, and I will give some preliminary remarks and then would really like people to ask questions. My name is Christy Ebai. I've been working on climate change issues for about 15 years. I'm currently the executive director of the technical support unit for working group two of the IPCC. Uh, Terry and Meg asked if I would talk with you a little bit about my experiences in Copenhagen, what happened in Copenhagen, and talk with you about the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I understand Meg talked with you last week, and she talked primarily about oceans and climate change. Do many of you, did anybody in the class actually go to Copenhagen? So we've got just a couple people who did go. Do, does everybody understand what the, the Conference of the Parties is? I knew there had to be sound. Does, do you all understand the Conference of the Parties and how all of that works? Got a lot of people saying yes. So, so the COP is an annual meeting where the countries get together to collectively make decisions. It's somewhat challenging to get 193 countries to come to collective decisions. It's become even more complicated over time. The COP two years ago was in Bali, and one of the major conclusions of Bali was the Bali Action Plan, where it's decided that the negotiations had four pillars. One was adaptation, one was mitigation, one was financial flows, and one was technology transfer. At Copenhagen, it was decided there would be a fifth pillar, red, reducing emissions through deforestation and degradation, from deforestation and degradation. And so you can imagine trying to get 193 countries to agree on five different, very different issues, and to try and come up with negotiating texts that they would sign off on. The way the COP works, it's two weeks long. The first part, the first week or so, you have negotiators from countries working on the issues that are going to be easier to resolve because you save the harder stuff for the end when you have your minister come in who's going to actually sign off. These are very serious issues for the countries. This intersects with their development goals. It intersects with their visions of how they interact with the world. It intersects with a whole range of issues. So they're complex issues. And at the end, when the ministers sign off, it really is the minister signing off. There has been cops where it's gotten down to the last moment, and there's a sticking point, and the question is, will some country actually agree to something? And we have seen people call back to their country knowing it's 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in their country, waking up the prime minister, the president, whomever, to say, can I sign off on this? These are serious issues for the countries. So the negotiators show up. There is a large imbalance across the negotiating teams. The US had 120 negotiators at COP. Most of the developed countries had around 100 to 120 negotiators. For the first time, Developing countries were funded to have two people. Most COPs, they have one person. So there's one negotiator for your country. The negotiations start. Text is discussed. There's a, some draft text that's put forward. Everybody can read. And you start word by word going through the draft text. 
if you get to something that you can't agree on, it's put in square brackets. The person chairing the session will then set out a contact group. And the contact group is to negotiate the text in the square brackets. There's dozens of parallel contact groups. You have one negotiator. They go from 8 o'clock in the morning until 1 or 2 in the morning. You have one negotiator. So the G77 meets every morning to try and decide who's going to cover what. You have very different goals from the country next door, from the country around the world. These are difficult decisions of what is it that you feel that you, your country believes is so important that you have to be at the table versus what can you trust somebody else to negotiate for you about. So there's a lot of complexity to what is going on. The teams do go off, they negotiate, you start working through all the square brackets, you try and get as far along as you can. And actually in Copenhagen, mostly I follow the adaptation. They made significant progress on the adaptation text. And if the other issues had made further progress, it's likely that they could have signed off on something. But not enough progress was made on the other issues, and so in fact it wasn't signed off on. In terms of the adaptation, one of the big issues, one of the sort of main events that happened at the COP was that developed countries were not truly listening to the developing countries. They're experiencing impacts due to climate change. They're having a hard time coping with it. And they've been telling the developed world with increasing, increasingly strong voices, we need help. And you need to help fund adaptation. And the, de the developed countries haven't truly been listening to it. And so sometime during the first week, at some point all these days run together, sometime during the first week, the G77 walked out of the negotiations, said, we're not going to negotiate if you're not going to be serious about adaptation. And they walked out, and there's no negotiations the rest of that day. Um, as you can imagine, there's lots going on to try and bring the G77 back to the negotiating table. Uh, Senator Clinton came, uh, gave a major address, promised that the US would work with the other developed countries to raise adaptation funds. And it's one of the things that helped move the negotiations forward. But as you know from what was put in all the newspapers, there's other issues that were very difficult to make much progress on. There was a lot of progress, a lot of difficulty making progress on red, a lot of difficulty making progress on the mitigation targets. Issues like technology transfer gets into copyright, what you do about copyright, what do you do about intellectual property. Very different opinions across the developed and the developing world about that. That's an issue that's been difficult, not only for climate change, but for many issues for quite a long period of time. And they just couldn't really make progress fast enough, which is why the accord that was signed, the agreement that was signed, is, is more or less a statement of principles on what the countries would like to see achieved in the broadest sense. I'm sure you've read lots of different opinions about the outcome of Copenhagen. At its fundamental, I think it was incredibly important and very valuable. 193 countries said we're, in the same, we're on the same planet. We've got a problem, and we have to address it together. We're not entirely sure how we're going to do this, but we are going to address it together. That outcome wasn't entirely clear six or eight months ago. There's been a lot of work over the last couple of years saying, really, not 193 countries are causing this problem. There's a small group of countries causing this. And should we just work out some bilaterals or maybe a multilateral with a few countries and just have the major emitters go off and make the decisions themselves. That would be problematic because that is the people who are, are the emitters making the major decisions without the people who are being most affected at the negotiating table. And so I think that it was a very, 
a very good conclusion. We all think it could have been done better in lots of different dimensions. It's very hard to get 193 countries to agree on much of anything. The atmosphere in Copenhagen, it was pretty much of a zoo. Uh, most of the cops are. This was worse than usual. People expected that. It was fairly poorly organized, which I think had something to do with the outcome of the negotiations. 45,000 people were registered to be able to attend. The Bella Center, where this was held, holds 15,000. The fire marshal said 15,001, and I shut you down. That's my job. And so every day, there was new and different rules. Every day, we would go through some different procedure to try and get into the Bella Center. For several days, they were busing us around Copenhagen and then drop us off basically the front door of the Bella Center. Well, then they decided that wasn't going to work. They now bust us all around and drove us off on a highway and then went here and went there and then dropped us off at the metro. It put too many people into the metro system. They closed the stop at the Bella Center so you couldn't actually get off at the Bella Center anymore. You had to walk more than a mile. Copenhagen's on the North Sea. It is cold. It is windy. And people didn't come dressed for that. On the one hand, they're democratic. They treated everybody the same. They left Jane Goodall out in the freezing cold for four hours before somebody could get her inside. Um, I saw the lead negotiator for India in a three-piece suit when it was about 23 degrees outside, being told he had to stand in the queue like everybody else. And it was going to be several hours before he could get in. I know people personally who took 13 hours to register to get in. For most of the NGOs, it was pretty common for people to take four, eight, nine, ten hours to get through the registration process to get in. So every day, by the time you got in, you felt the major accomplishment of the day was you actually got in. This is not a good way to have people, happy people negotiating. When you've gone through crowds of protesters, you're pushed around. You have to push yourself through these crowds to try and be able to get in. I don't think that helped at all. By the second week, it had gotten so bad and was so disorganized that it was decided there would be new rules. So on Monday, they announced that on Tuesday, you had to have a second badge. You couldn't just have the badge that you get in with. You had to have another badge before you'd be allowed in. And they went through, and for all of the non-governmental organizations, the NGOs, they basically cut the number of people allowed in in half. Terry Root, Steve Schneider had a class on leading up to the Copenhagen. They had 37 students. They had themselves. They had a grad student. They had somebody to help them, 41 people on their delegation. They were told 16 could come in. You've got students who raised a lot of money to go there, who put a lot of effort into finding housing, which was incredibly problematic. And now they can't go in. This is part of the coursework that they're taking. Senior researchers that I know in Japan who flew to Copenhagen for four days to give a series of presentations can't give all of them because they can't get in. Their delegation is more than cut in half. People couldn't get in the front door. Researchers who came to present their findings are stuck out in queues. They can't get in. It's too slow. That happened on Tuesday. On Wednesday, about 7,000 NGOs had gotten into the building. Friends of the Earth started a demonstration. The security was nervous. Everyone around the world knew there's 120 heads of state that are coming in. They shut the Bella Center down. No more NGOs are allowed in. Oh, and by the way, no more NGOs are allowed in. And you're going to need a third badge to get in on Thursday. And you have to be present to pick it up. And we're going to give it out at 6 o'clock at night. So if you're in, you can't leave. If you're outside the door, you're trying to figure out how to get somebody in. And by the way, they didn't pass it out until 9 o'clock at night. So on Thursday of the second week, they only let in 1,000 NGOs. And on Friday, I think it was only 500. 
So all of this is going on around what people are trying there to do. They're there to negotiate. And I don't think that helped at all. It was really badly done. I just found it amazing that a developed country, one day we had snow, 24, and it was not a lot, it was an inch of snow. 24 hours later, I was standing on the train platform, I want to take the train somewhere, and it's a train to the airport. It's the only way that people have to get to the airport. And it was running five hours late, and people were missing flights all over the place because they couldn't get a train, just a little bit of snow. The whole thing just wasn't working on lots of different dimensions. And again, I do think that had an influence on how well people were negotiating. If you have to go through all of this just to get in the front door, you're not starting in a very happy frame of mind. But despite that, people worked really hard on it. People come to the cops and they spend two weeks getting almost no sleep. They work on this all day, every day. They negotiate half the night, sometimes more than half the night, to try and come to an agreement. It's a very important process and institution. Again, it's 193 countries. How do you get them to, to say we're going to work together in a constructive way to achieve common goals, when in fact all the countries have different kinds of goals. And yet at the end they said we need to keep working on this together. It's going to be hard to work out the details. On all of these issues it's going to be very problematic to get the very specific language that people will sign off on. And whatever they do sign off on, everyone's going to complain about. It's too strong, it's not strong enough. One of the things that I don't see articulated well enough when people talk about this process is taking into, into account that basically we're in a 100-year race and we've run a few laps. And yes, we'd like to be further ahead than we are at the moment. And we don't want to have the kinds of things happen that are projected to happen with climate change. And it's happening faster than we thought but we're still in this very long race. And we have to keep moving forward. And we may be able to move forward faster on some issues at some points in time than on others. But to keep both the short and the long term in focus and understand that this is a long term commitment and the best way to do this is to do it together. So that's probably enough rambling from me. I would love to take questions on this to make sure that, that I talk about the things that you would like to hear about. So does, would anybody like to ask a question? Good, we guess we'll start. So the question is, are 193 countries really going to agree? In the end, I think the answer is yes. And that's one of the strengths of Copenhagen, is despite all of the difficulties over the last year on trying to work towards a Copenhagen agreement, in the end, the country said, this has been really hard and we're still going to do it together. We're not going to give up on the process. I think that is really the strongest and most important statement from the COP. And that certainly will keep the process moving forward for any number of years because it, it was so difficult. There's been so many negotiating sessions and still the countries concluded we've got to do this together. There's a question back in here. Yeah. So you said it's a hundred year race, but I'd like to get a, a more realistic sense of a time frame in which we have the luxury to negotiate still without it being already sort of at that point where we've had too many tipping points. So is it more like a 10, 20, 30 year time frame that you think is the critical period that we need to come to agreement in, or is it five years? I mean, I don't, I would think it's shorter than 30. The answer to that depends on the perspective from which you look at it. I do a lot of work on the health impacts of climate change. And children are already suffering and dying due to climate change. So in some places, it's already too late. There's ecosystems that are labeled as functionally extinct. We're going to lose them. We know that. So in some ways, it's too late. In other ways, it's not. 
so it's, there's huge inequity in this issue. The answer to when is the next tipping point, we don't know. The key unknown is climate sensitivity. How much will the climate change for a doubling of CO2 concentrations? There's all kinds of estimates around that. That's one of the major issues that the IPCC looks at in each assessment report. And that uncertainty has not been narrowed by additional science. And at this point, from, and I work on the impacts and adaptation side, from this point, from our perspective, I think we need to stop worrying about the climate sensitivity. We may not know it until after we pass it. We need to think very clearly about what the impacts are likely to be and what the adaptations, what adaptations need to be put into place. Because we know for almost all the projected impacts, those projections are done without considering adaptation. And the extent to which we're going to see impacts completely depend on us. And it's a real, it should be a motivating factor for people to engage much more strongly on the adaptation as well as on the mitigation. Are you including costs of adaptation into the negotiation of the financial flows? Yeah, the costs of adaptation are part of the financial flows. They're also within the adaptation negotiations. And that's where they came up with. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to look this up. So within a few years, $10 billion a year for adaptation. By 2020, about $100 billion a year for adaptation. Annually? Sorry? Annually? Yeah. Yeah. Annually. Sorry, I think this woman was first and then you. Yeah. Now, can you say a little bit more about that uh, you're on a committee of the IPCC or a section of the ICC and what's your background? You spoke about impacts and adaptations. You have to store uh, yeah. what, where do you come from this one? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has three working groups. Working group one looks at the climate science. Working group two looks at impact and adaptation. Working group three looks at mitigation. The IPCC is the countries themselves. Any country that's a member of the World Meteorological Organization or the United Nations Environment Program can be part, is part of the IPCC because the IPCC was formed by these two organizations in 1988. The countries get together on an annual basis to undertake a series of decisions. One of the decisions they undertake every now and then is we should do another assessment. The scientists go away in between the assessments. So the decision is we're going to have another assessment. The first step in that process is co-chairs are identified for each of the working groups. There's one from a developed and one from a developing country. For this round, for the fifth assessment cycle, the co-chairs for working group two are Vicente Barros, an Argentinian who's a climatologist and been working on adaptation and Chris Field, who's at Carnegie. One of the promises from the developed country is if they support a co-chair, then they give the co-chair a technical support unit. Chris and Vicente are the face of working group two. The technical support unit has to make sure the whole thing happens. I'm running the technical support unit. My background is an epidemiologist. Um, been working on climate change and health for about 15 years, been working on adaptation for almost as long up until the time when I took this position, spent most of my time with developing countries on developing adaptation projects. And I still spend part of my time doing that. What would be a specific adaptation project that you've worked on? Uh, last week I was in Ghana working with the government, working with the Ministry of Health, the Ghana Health Service, Environmental Protection Agency, the National Department for Development and Economic Planning, a couple NGOs putting together a proposal to the Global Environment Facility to get $1.7 million to help them adapt to increased cases of cholera, meningitis, and malaria. So the question is around the US emission commitments. I don't know what the US is going to do. Um, the, the US, any any country that is a signatory to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, as part of signing the convention, promises to undergo regular, essentially regular assessments. They're called national communications. 
The developing countries have all done their initial national communication. Most are working on their second. A few are working on their third. They're not in very regular cycles. The developed countries report theirs every couple of years. The US has been reporting those out of the Environmental Protection Agency, out of EPA. So EPA usually writes these up. They've got three sections. One is on the emissions. Second one is on vulnerability, impacts, and adaptation. And the third is on mitigation options. The US negotiating team has traditionally been led by the State Department. And uh, this time, OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology uh, for the President, was heavily involved as well in the negotiations. They also have on their team, there was folks from NOAA, NASA, NSF, you name it. They had all the agencies represented. So specifically, I don't know if they're going to report. And I, I think it would come out of EPA, because traditionally, that's where it comes from. So uh, can we go back to the technical support group and how the working groups work and so forth? The uh, reason I ask is, uh, I talk to Chris now, um, is that uh, uh, there's a lot of people out there that think all, all the scientists are employees of the UN and there's these vast pots of money. <laughs> the UN. Yes. Uh, yeah. Could you talk about you know, how many people are actually working on this? Uh, how does the funding actually work? Because I know it isn't the way most people say. Well, first of all, these assessments rely on the scientists. Um, the technical support unit, when we're fully staffed, will have six, maybe eight people. Um, hopefully, we can get more than that, because this round, we've got 30 chapters and a special report. Last time, we had 20 chapters. It was a much smaller task. The way the process works is actually starting last Friday. A letter went from the secretariat for the IPCC. There's a permanent secretariat based in Geneva. Each country that's a member of the IPCC has a focal point. So the letter went from the secretariat to the focal points asking for nominations for authors for the fifth assessment cycle. Each chapter in working group two it works a little differently across the working groups. But for working group two, each chapter has two coordinating lead authors, one from a developed, one from a developing country. And those two people are responsible for all the activities to produce the chapter. They have a series of lead authors, um, traditionally somewhere in the neighborhood of six to eight lead authors. So each chapter team is somewhere around the size of eight to 10 people. They volunteer all of their time. It's sort of a standing joke that all of us have a pro, pro bono job at the IPCC from midnight till t to about 4 AM um, when you're working on the assessment. Nobody's paid. In the last cycle, I put in about five months of work on the IPCC. And not a, not a minute of that is paid for. You do it because it's important, because you're committed to it. The only thing that's paid is we have four lead author meetings. And for the developed countries, the developed country pays for your travel. They pay for your airfare. They pay for the hotel. They pay for your food. That's it. For the developing countries, there's an IPCC trust fund. And the trust fund pays for the developing countries. The other group of people who have to be um, nominated are review editors. Each chapter has two review editors. The reason this is an assessment, not a review, is the review editors. We start our process. We get our authors together. We already have a, an outline that was approved by the plenary, the IPCC plenary. The authors get together, and the first thing they do is develop a zero order draft, which goes out to friendly reviewers because every zero order draft comes back from a friendly review saying you still have a lot of work left to do. Um, you take the zero order draft comments, and then you produce what's called a first order draft. And the first order draft goes out to very widely to scientists around the world to get review comments. My chapter last time was fairly typical. 
for the first order draft, we had about 115 pages of review comments on a 35-page chapter in an Excel spreadsheet in eight-point font. And you have to write a written response to each and every comment. Every single comment has to have a response. And the review editor's job is to say, in fact, not only did you write the response, but you did what you said you were going to do. And so they're there to do the due diligence to really make sure that, in fact, the author team is taking comments into consideration. You then write a second order draft, and it goes back to the first set of reviewers plus every government. You get the second order draft comments back, and it's of a similar magnitude. Anybody who works on this will talk about the reviews. Any scientists in the room, this is peer review like you've never seen it. For working group two last time, across the 20 chapters, across the two reviews, we had more than 40,000 comments from hundreds of scientists around the world and from over 50 countries. This is really extensive. This is why any of us who've worked on this, you read the stuff in the paper about how somehow we're all biased, somehow, somehow this is some kind of, I don't know, how they think you could go through this. And having people look over your shoulder, making sure that you are indeed addressing the comments that they've raised. And I can tell you, if you don't address it appropriately in the first round from the experts, they're going to bring it up in the second round. When we get the nominations for the lead authors and the review editors, each of our working groups has a bureau. It's six people that represents the 193 countries. They go through all of the nominations, and we choose the authors based on expertise, geography, and gender. And we have to make sure we've got appropriate balance within and across chapters. Right now, we're working on a special report on managing the risks of extreme events and disasters to advance climate change adaptation. We've got about 100 authors. We had 400 nominations. And it's a hard job to go through and read every CV and decide what kind of expertise you're going to need within particular chapters and where you can best draw that expertise from, making sure, again, that you have balance across gender and across geography. So it's quite an extensive process. It's a well-documented process. For the AR4, all of our review comments and all of the responses are online. Anybody can go take a look at them. So when, when we read the stuff in the paper trying to claim somebody tried to bias this set or the other thing, well, go look at the review comments. You can't do that. So, so what fraction, for working group two, what kind of fraction are you like, Vincent Perry from New Zealand or a group one? I think he gets like 1,500 comments of which 1% are accepted. Yeah, do you get that in working group two? Is that mostly you? Oh, the question is, yeah, we have a few reviewers that are that. Interesting. Yeah, we, we, there's somebody at the Department of the Interior who I think spends his entire life reading IPCC reports and providing comments. We do have people who provide extensive lists of comments. Um, it, it's a pretty amazing process. And it, it pushes, it's hard. You get these review comments back, and you've written a page, and you've got 30, 40, 50 comments on one page of text. Some people love it, some people hate it. Some people say delete this. Some people say emphasize the same point stronger. And how you, come, how you can work within your author team to come up with text that you think fairly represents the science and takes these comments into account. It's, it's hard work. Yeah. It was an article in the Times today, yesterday, about the mistake that was made in reporting the Himalayan uh, glacial uh, disappearance by 2043 or 34 versus 2340 or something like that. How, how does that happen? Yeah, that was really unfortunate. It was a regional chapter, and traditionally it's been harder to, it's harder for the regional chapters 
uh, people would rather work in the sectoral chapters. If they're water experts, they'd rather work on the water resources chapter than on their regional chapter, partly because, how do I want to say this? The sectoral chapters are in some ways more challenging. There's more literature available. It provides you opportunities to look at issues in depth in ways you may not have had time to before to work with world-class scientists on these issues. The regional chapters have to address everything. Again, they're still small author teams. They're all from the region. And so each person's got to cover a broader range of issues, often not quite as much depth as you would in the sectoral chapters. For many regions, there's just not as much peer-reviewed published literature. You, have to revo you really do have to rely on the gray literature. And it's one of the constant challenges we have. We all know gray literature that is better peer-reviewed than some of the stuff that we read, even in nature and science. Um, and there's no question you can rely on it. There's other stuff that you shouldn't be. We do heavily rely on this peer review process. 40,000 comments on an uh, eight, 900 page report is a lot of review. In this case, reviewers didn't, didn't notice it. I don't know what happened within the chapter team. I wasn't part of that chapter team. Um, discussions were had. Um, something was cited that shouldn't have been cited. It didn't have the basis that it should have had. It's still pretty amazing that we can put out across three working groups. I've forgotten how long the other reports are, but last time they're all around eight, 900 pages. So you're putting out thousands of pages of text. And people have focused on a place where the rules and procedures didn't work the way they should have. And it's, it's recommitted all of us to make sure that, in fact, we do follow those rules and procedures and make sure that that doesn't happen in the fifth cycle. I should also say that the focus has been on the fact that there was a statement that the Himalayan glaciers are going to disappear by 2035. They're not likely to. However, glaciers all around the world are melting at an appalling rate. And so the emphasis we all write their chapters. From the chapters, there's in a technical summary. And from the technical summary, there's in a summary for policymakers. The summary for policymakers goes to the world governments. And they go through the summary for policymakers word by word. It takes a week. It's difficult. It's difficult because countries have got different perspectives on what they would like to see the summary for policymakers focus on. They have, they have different perspectives on the kind of language that they would like to see used. The scientists have done the assessment. It has to, whatever is said in the summary for policymakers, has to reflect what's in the underlying chapters. So it's, an inter, it's a very interesting negotiation. It can get very tense. It also can be fairly entertaining. It was, I think it was a second assessment report. Thinking of glaciers, there was a statement in the summary for policymakers that most of the world's glaciers were retreating. Well, two countries, the US and Saudi Arabia, wanted to change it not to most, but to many. And there was a 45-minute discussion on should it be most or should it be many. The way this process works is the lead authors can't say anything until they're invited to. They finally invited one of the, the CLAs to say something. And he said there's, I don't know, 14,263 glaciers in the world, whatever the number is, and 13,950 are retreating. And if you, want to call, if you want to call that many, you can buy me many beers after we're over. <laughs> <laughs> it is challenging. So you have to make sure that the SPM does reflect what's in the chapters. And so what people are picking up is something that was said in the chapter but you don't see it in the technical summary, and you don't see it in the summary for policymakers. It, it, it's unfortunate, and we're working hard to make sure that's not going to happen this round. So the first question, I sort of know most the answer to. I don't know most the answer to it. The question was, does every COP resi result in binding agreements? No. If you look back, this was a 15th COP. Um, in Marrakesh, they came up with a Marrakesh Accord, which suggested they're going to do a range of things. So most of the COPs don't. This COP was particularly important because of Kyoto Protocol, and this was supposed to have been the deadline by which 
whatever comes after Kyoto was going to be agreed. It's been particularly challenging. So no, many COPs come out with a whole series of agreements, but without something binding. And the, the second point, I guess, is, is that um, many of the people who attended seem to suggest that, it, that the Copenhagen was a success. I mean, the fact that you know people got to the table and started talking about it. But with the fact that, I guess, none of the major companies have submitted plans for reducing CO2. Um, less than two dozen had even submitted letters saying that they agreed to the accord. Um, no progress for spelling out the $30 billion for um, financing the short-term um, program for the hardest hit, on and on and on. It, for me, it, it, it seems kind of difficult to be optimistic when what from a distance appears to be a group of people who don't want to agree on anything for fear of being contentious or ensuring that, that, that this accord fails. And I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, and it's probably spilling over into the realm of politics, but what might be done to hold people's feet to the fire in a way that gets them to act on something as profoundly important as this issue? It's a big challenge to try and get countries to agree. Look at our own Congress. It's pretty challenging to get our Congress to agree on anything. Um, these are difficult processes. One of the things that I've seen is the US has been incredibly fortunate in that there's been fairly few big events that you could say are consistent with climate change here. So most people in the US do not feel like they've seen any impacts of climate change. That's not true in many parts of the world. And you can see, I've done a lot of work in Europe, and in one five-year period in Europe, Europe had eight one in 500-year weather events. So not only were Europeans already ahead of the US to begin with, but every time they turned around, the heat wave in 2000, the heat waves in 2003, 70,000 excess deaths, 70,000 people. They had floods, they had storms, they had droughts. And that really pushes policy. The weather, in some ways, wins. Climate change is increasing the probability of a whole range of extreme events. What if a Category 5 hurricane hit Miami? US politics would change overnight. So I think some of this is going to be weather-driven. I can say from my experiences, from the cops that I've gone to, the negotiators are really committed to this. They really understand. Many of them have been working. I know, I know negotiators who've been to every cop. They know the issue through and through. They know the risks. They know the challenges. And they really are trying to find ways to reach common agreement. As this has gotten larger, it's become somewhat more complex. There's always been countries who've been more challenging to cope with than others for a range of reasons. Um, one of the big, big consequences of Copenhagen is the Chinese signing off on, yes, we can have monitoring and verification. That's a cultural issue in China. If a Chinese says, I will do something, and you say, you're going to have to show me that you did, it's a slap in the face. And so you're also dealing not only with all these political issues, you're dealing with all these cultural issues of how people view the world. If I say I'm going to do it, why should, I have to, why should you have to look and see that I said I did it? That's hard. It, and it's hard to find the common ground when we have all different kinds of beliefs and we approach the world in lots of different ways. It's tough. And yet these people are committed to moving it forward. We didn't get as far as anybody wanted to. And next year, they'll go further. It's just, you just have to have faith that these multinational processes work, because it's the only way we're going to get to something that, it's the only way we can get to a planet where our children and their children will have viable ecosystems 
be able to live the kinds of lives that we're living. That's Mexico City next year, right? Mexico City's next year, yeah. What Qu what's gonna happen in Mexico? Is it a continuation of this? Question is what <laughs> you know <laughs> Sorry. My big, one of my biggest disappointments in life is I never got a functioning crystal ball. If, if I had had one, my life would have been so much easier. I don't know what's going to happen I, in Mexico I, I, City. By, by that, I mean, I mean, is, is the plan just a continuation of uh, discussions about what took place here in Copenhagen, or, or is it a completely different uh, no, it's, it's, topic so altogether? I'm sure what's going to happen is there'll be, there'll be lots of negotiations between now and Mexico City. And Mexico City is the next major event where people will try to reach binding agreements. Whether or not they achieve that is a good question, but that's the intention is to move forward so that there will be binding agreements. Yeah. Um, there was an interview with Jim Hansen, who's the leading scientist in climate science, and Jeffrey Sachs. And they said two things that were I hadn't heard. One was that with all these open sentences, brackets for all the year or two that, that there wasn't going to be a good Copenhagen outcome. And secondly, they were both promoting that the U.S. and the other major countries should just do their own thing and then try to impose that on others. And what are your comments on that? I think it's a bad idea. I think it's a bad idea for a small group of people to go and make decisions for the large group of people. What's that? No, just corporate, corporate money for elections now. You know, it's like a small. Well, it, it's the U.S. moved away from the smoke-filled rooms for determining who is going to be put up for office. By and large, the countries have a stake in these negotiations. The Maldives are in serious trouble. A whole series of small island states are in serious trouble. They don't think decisions should be made without them at the table. If it doesn't, if the large contributors don't start making changes, they're going to be underwater anyway. So it's in their interest to get a decision quickly, not to impede that. It's in everybody's best interest to have a decision quickly. It's going to be difficult to get buy-in on the decision unless people are involved in that decision-making process. Science is moving a lot further, not quite as fast either, into more stakeholder engagement in terms of working with communities. You have to work with the people who are going to be affected by the decision. The way I look at it is the way a republic is versus a true democracy. In a true democracy, everybody gets a chance at the, at the table. The problem is then you never get anywhere. You elect representatives that go and represent you, okay, and you reduce the number of people in order to be able to make a decision. Um, and it, it seems to me that that of those 193, there's a large number of countries that, whether or not they agreed or not, wouldn't make that big of a difference. I agree; it would be great if they did. But, but there are key countries that have to. There's key countries that have to. And if everybody else isn't at the table, people don't get to represent what it is that is at risk. And that's part of what the developing countries do, is they come in and say, here is what's at risk. You're not seeing. You're, you're, you're looking at the world through a particular perspective. Let us show you our perspective. If you look in the U.S. I'm not saying they shouldn't be represented. I'm just saying they shouldn't be represented necessarily as an individual country. Well, it's the way the U.N. works. I understand. But it's, it's I mean, I've done, I, I helped the state of Alaska with their adaptation assessment. I bet very few people in this room understand what's going on right now with climate change in Alaska. It's the same kind of problem. Unless you have the people at risk at the table, you're not going to really see what's going on. In Alaska, there's people right now whose ancestors have lived in the same location for 10,000 years. And with permafrost melt, they're losing their land, their community, their culture. They're losing everything. 
and they're watching what's going on down in the lower 48 and saying, you're not really listening to what we are already experiencing and we're being left out of the discussion. It doesn't help facilitate not only climate change negotiations, but all negotiations. And what the developing countries have been doing more and more is turning back to the developed world and say, boy, you'd like an agreement on whatever it is you'd like an agreement on. Well, let me tell you, we're really worried about climate change. And if you're not going to help us with the impacts we're seeing with climate change, if you're not going to talk seriously about what are major issues for us, we're not going to negotiate with you on other issues. Yeah. So you start off by talking about the difficulty around driving consensus with 192 countries. So you have that on the one hand. On the other hand, you don't want to marginalize anyone. Everyone wants to see at the table. Is there a third way? And is COP thinking about transforming its way of you know, sort of balancing this? For the COP to decide on a third way, they'd all have to agree on a third way. <laughs> um, there's lots of discussion of what to do about this process, and everyone understands the, the costs and the benefits of taking this kind of approach. And people have not really seen a third way. There's a, there's a hybrid with a few of the higher emitters getting together and putting forward some text and saying, this is what we can agree to. Um, and we'll see how that plays out over time. This is, this is an experiment in global governance. And uh, we're doing learning by doing. 100 years from now, people will look back and say, boy, you guys were really primitive in how you thought you could get everybody to agree on issues. But we have to work on it. So, so the first question was about a third way. And trying to get 193 countries to agree to make a change, you might as well just get 193 countries to agree to do something. Um, but I'm not in charge of the process. I don't, I don't, I don't have a very good crystal ball. I don't know what they're going to decide. The second question was, is $100 billion a year enough for adaptation? There have been a number of estimates of the cost of adaptation. Almost all of them have been around $100 billion a year. Everyone knows the estimates are underestimates for a whole range of reasons. But it's getting into the ballpark of what countries can do. And this would be the money that would come through the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Countries are also putting money in separately through different processes. In the UK, the Department for International Development went to the bank, the World Bank, um, just about a year ago and said, we're concerned the least developed countries have all done something called NAPA's National Adaptation Programs of Action to identify their most urgent needs. And this was done because they were to identify their urgent needs and there was, an impl there was the implied promise then that there would funding become available underneath the convention for them to address those. And the funding has been very slow to come. And the funding that has come hasn't been distributed very fast for a range of reasons. So anyway, DFID went to the World Bank and said, we're really worried about this. Here's some seed money. And in under nine months, they raised $500 million to help 10 countries address their urgent needs under their NAPAs. So there's a lot of money coming in through other venues. And by the way, any developing country will tell you until 2009, the sum total of what the US put into any of the adaptation funds. Anybody want to guess? That's it. The US has put, until last year, has put zero dollars into any adaptation funds under the convention. That has come up in negotiations on a whole range of issues, not just climate change. As the US wants to have a base in a country, for example, it's brought up under a lot of different contexts. So $100 billion through the convention would be great. There's other money that will come in as well. Countries themselves, Bangladesh has put forward, I forgot how much they put forward, but they took money out of their budget and are working on adaptation to climate change. They've done more on adaptation to climate change than most countries. Um, they're about 15 years ahead of the US on adaptation plans and implementation. We won't know if it's enough until we get there. It's, a, it's an honest promise that everybody hopes they meet 
because it does seem to be about in the ballpark of what all the estimates are for the annual costs. So the question was specifically on drought issues in Kenya. I haven't worked in Kenya. Um, I've worked with Jordan and with Barbados. They're both water stress countries. I met with the head of the water management group in Barbados. They lose about 75% of their annual water through leakage in their system. I don't think Jordan's quite as bad, but I've talked to several cities in the US who say the US loses a huge amount through leakage. So one, one step is just much better infrastructure because I, I'm not done yet. It's not leakage, though. It's, I mean, I'm speaking, I'm speaking about just, you know, the of rivers being empty. It's not they're leaking, but they just don't have rain. I can understand that, but I'm starting. There, there's simple things that can be done that would improve the situation in many countries. There's a lot of investment into technologies going on, and that's where a lot of focus is going to be and where hopefully a fair amount of money will go into research and development on different kinds of approaches. I personally don't work on this issue. I have been in any number of meetings where people are talking about a variety of different options. People are worried about internal migration, external migration. There's a lot of concern that water is going to be a major driver of migration issues. I can tell you the NGOs are talking about how they would handle those kinds of situations. Um, the future is going to look very different from the past. Nobody's prepared. Even the NGOs who worry about this haven't really thought as deeply as I think they should have about the possible extremes and what those might look like. There is greater focus now on extremes and how, how countries can better be prepared to respond to those. In some situations, there just isn't going to be an option. There's small island states that eventually will disappear. Most of them before that will have saltwater intrusion into the freshwater lens and will be uninhabitable long before they'll be inundated. So there are places where there's going to have to be very difficult choices about how to handle people who have lived in a place for a long time, how can you maintain their cultures, what really are the options? We're conducting a massive experiment, and many of these parts of the experiment, we really haven't thought enough about how, in fact, to keep current levels of human health and well-being, we lovely if we could improve them in the face of the risks that are coming. So the question was about the Alaska adaptation. It was a fairly large process in the state. It was done by the state. The governor appointed, and I won't get all the names and the titles right, but she appointed some kind of subcommittee that, re that reported directly to her and tasked that committee with doing an adaptation assessment. There was four working groups. One was on health and culture. I worked on that. There was one on... I never remember. I've worked on a couple of these, and they all sort of run together at some point. But one's sort of on natural resources, one's on infrastructure, and there's another one. It was a pretty interesting process. We had a broad range of stakeholders. We had pretty much monthly conference calls. And we had members of the public. We had NGOs. We had people from the responsive departments within the state. And the first step was to identify all of the adaptation options that people could think of to address the risks that they, they know Alaska's facing. We ended up with 80 options. The governor said, I want about five. So we underwent a process to try and prioritize across those to see which ones were similar enough that we could combine and come up with, with five. The five, if I can remember correctly, one of them was pretty much focused on communication issues. A second was focused on how to help rural communities. I'm sure you've heard that there's a range of rural communities that are going to have to move due to climate change. And I know I won't get the numbers right, but in order to reach, to get to the point where you can move your community, you have to deal with 23 different federal and state agencies. These are communities of a few hundred people. 23 different agencies. 
and I know I won't get this right, but it doesn't matter. I don't have the order right. But you can't move a community until you have an airport. You can't have an airport until you have a post office. You can't have a post office until you have a school. And you can't have a school until you have an airport. <laughs> so one of the options was basically, can we give these guys a break? Can somebody actually help them navigate this maze? of regulations they have to go through to try and, and, and move their communities and, and address the other issues. There was one on archaeological sites because grave sites are being exposed from being washed away and what to do about addressing the most urgent ones of those. Another was on public health surveillance. They're seeing more vector-borne diseases in Alaska. Um, they're starting to see outbreaks of diseases that they've never seen before. They had an outbreak a couple of years ago of uh, pretty nasty gastroenteritis that comes from oysters. And it was 1,000 kilometers north, 600 miles north of the last known northern range of this disease. So there was a big program on surveillance. And the last one, I don't remember what it was end up being called. In the health sector, we call it health impact assessments. And we had very strong disagreement with using that term. But it was basically saying choices are being made in a whole range of sectors on what to do to adapt and to mitigate for climate change. And those have health impacts. And that those should be looked at before they're implemented. A number of years ago, for incredibly good reasons, Ethiopia put in a bunch of microdams because they had food security problems, because they didn't have enough water, and so to improve irrigation, they put in the microdams. The choice was made by the, basically the agricultural sector, the people who work on food security. Microdams were put in. Malaria went up tenfold in the villages around the microdams. And the health sector said, you don't have to kill children before you take action. It's those kinds of ideas of making sure that people look at what the consequences might be before actions are implemented. And so those are, that's sort of the broad outline of the five that went up to the governor. As you know, she's now resigned. And I have no idea what's going to happen with this next. But it's publicly available. There's a website. You can download everything that we did. You can download the 80 options we came up with, the, the notes we had from every conference call, um, the members of the committee, what we put forward, final documents available. You know. I don't know. <laughs> well, what would you search on? Well, if you, if you search on the Alaska Adaptation Assessment, um, I can almost get to it, but I can't quite remember. But several states, Alaska, Maryland, Washington, California, have all done adaptation assessments that included health. Uh, several other states have done adaptation assessments that did not include health. I know Florida has done one. I have, I've not been involved in the ones that didn't have health. So there's quite a few states that have done these, and you can go take a look. There's a number of NGOs that are looking across all of these at lessons learned and, and pulling information together. Yeah? I is there a website where the highest priority adaptation issues that countries are facing is posted? Yeah. If you go to the UNFCCC website, which is www.unf ccc.int, and you search on national communications, you'll get all of the national communications. It'll come up. If you search on the NAPAs, it will come up with the, the National Adaptation Programs of Action for the LDCs. But are those compiled anywhere as a global list, in the sense like <coughs> major things going on now that are climate change? Yes and no. There's been a whole series of publications about the NAPAs. The Secretariat for the UNFCCC has put out a number of documents summarizing the major issues that have come out. So those are all, the ones that have been done are all available. I think they've had a few in hard copy, and I don't remember if they've scanned them or not, but basically they've all come in PDFs. Not all of them are in English, of course. Um, a major thing I'm hearing is that I think that that information is not widely available here. And I think we are a little bit in an information bubble that we don't get information about these impacts that are climate related. Um, it just seems like we need to have 
the science and all this academic information come out of the science bubble that it's in and get more mass distribution. I'm wondering if there's been a discussion about how to do that because you ask people in this country if they even know what the National Academy of Sciences are and nine out of ten people on the street probably don't know what that is. And I, I'm not sure how we're going to get out of that problem because people say, oh, you know, my opinion, the weather's, you know, doesn't show climate change because they're looking at what they see and they don't read the science. So that's a major issue. I think there's a lot of opportunities. One that I keep pushing, and one of these days somebody will actually do, is um, I've talked with lots of folks who do a variety of different kinds of media. Do a story about climate change in your backyard. People are seeing it in their backyard. I always use my family as an example. My sister gardens. Two years ago, without any fanfare whatsoever, all of the hardiness zones were changed due to climate change. People can now plant things they couldn't plant before and can't plant things they used to. My brother's a fisherman. Just don't go there. The fish is warmer. The, the, the water's warmer. The fish are deeper. Takes a lot of courage to bring up that topic. Um, <laughs> My, my dad watches birds. Bird migration patterns have very clearly changed. One of the things that, that was handed out at the COP that I really liked is the UN Foundation handed out playing cards. They were called Climate Change, It's Personal. They ran a campaign, and they, they chose 52 entries. And they had beautiful photographs with each one of them. And these are from individuals of how climate change is affecting them. And reading through these is just very moving of what is important to different individuals around climate change. I mentioned this yesterday when I was in Atlanta at the American Meteorological Society. And one of the broadcast meteorologists thought it was great and came up and wanted more information because he wants to do it in his area. So I do think you're going to see more people taking up these ideas that, in fact, we're all seeing climate change. Just look outside, and you see the spring is coming sooner. Or you're seeing lots of different kinds of patterns change. And getting people to understand that, in fact, this is going on. Yeah. Well, it's actually, but Chris, but I really wish chapter one of working group two were, when in working group one, where more people would see that. Because the, the biological evidence is, is so compelling, more compelling than you know, drawings of, of temperature. Yeah, so the last time around, chapter one looked at the biologic evidence. And as of sort of right now, there's more than 1,000 publications on how climate change has affected ecosystems. And to try and get that into working group one, which looks at the climate science, based on the feedback I get from countries, I think most of the focus on this round is going to be on working group two. Working group one last time, the major statement was climate change is unequivocal. Humans are influencing the climate. And most people outside of the US get that. And you know, they've signed off. They get it. Great. And now they're saying, what are the impacts? And that's one of the reasons why we went from the last time we had 20 chapters. This time we've got 30. We've got a lot more sectors that we're looking at. We're looking at things in a lot more detail. Uh, we've got a separate chapter on food security, a separate chapter on water availability. We've got a chapter on the cost of adaptation. We've got a chapter on oceans. So we're, we're looking at things in a lot more detail. And the focus of the countries, we have to go through and have a plenary approved outline. We go in front of the countries that, that form the IPCC. We did that at the end of October in Bali. We had concurrent sessions. It's the only way we could get up through all three working groups. We had, in some cases, twice as many country representatives as the other working groups. Everybody was in the working group, too. They wanted to see what we were doing. They wanted to comment on what we were doing. So I think you'll see, and that chapter now is no longer chapter one or two. We put it down in the concluding chapters. But it'll still be there. Yeah. yeah. Countries or several countries in Europe who went through a process of about 30, perhaps 40 years of education and very intense education about climate change. And I think this is probably the main reason why there is such a broad support in many European countries for this. So I don't see that the US is going through anything similar at all. So I would totally agree with you on this. And in fact, I would even see that, that the majority of the people don't actually 
believe in climate change in Paris. So now we are just submitting our carbon uh, emission targets. So I guess there needs to be some legislation behind this to ensure that this is really being met. So if the majority of the population, if I'm right about this, doesn't support those targets, how can we ensure this is actually being met? The US has been, not only is the US far behind, but there's eight years where you couldn't push this issue at all. And the US has moved quite quickly. Again, I was at the American Meteorological Society meetings. Lots of discussion on how to better educate. Um, one of the things that I really hope will happen is an idea that came actually from my dad. He's an automotive engineer. The Society of Automotive Engineers a number of years ago looked around at the state of science and engineering education in the US and kind of concluded it could be improved. Um, and they went out and got somebody to write a series of modules. They're focusing on middle schools. And they have all these modules. And if you're a member of the SAE, you can have these modules for free. And my dad, for years, has volunteered one or two hours a year to go into the local middle school to teach. And it's a win all the way around. The kids love. They've got somebody other than the teacher. The teacher loves. They get an hour off. Um, and he has a good time teaching these middle school kids. And so we were talking at AMS, which is tens of thousands. I forgot how many tens of thousands of, of members they have. And if you look at the big societies, the American Public Health Association, over 10,000 members. If you, just those two societies, if you get 20% of the people to volunteer one hour a year, you could fundamentally change education on climate change within just a year or two. So there's lots of discussions to see if we could make that happen, because I think it would be a great idea. There's lots of people who care a lot about climate change, who understand a fair amount. And if somebody writes a module, has it available for them, all they got to do is call the local school district and say, I'd like to come in. But what, what, are, what is your opinion? What are the chances that we really get some strong legislation around the cap and trade or something like that? It's always hard to know what the US is going to do. I think one of the benefits of the Copenhagen Agreement being vague as it is, is it's going to be easier to get it through Congress. Because the administration didn't go and make really specific promises that Congress could react against. It's all sort of general. And so I think there is a real opportunity. And the administration has worked hard. If you look who's at the head of the agencies, it's just an amazing group of people. Um, Steve Chu's been working on technology and climate change for a long time. Jane Lubchenco has been working on climate change. John Holdren's been in climate change for more than 20 years. Lisa Jackson's been working on climate change. So the heads of all the agencies have really strong experience with climate change. And clearly, the administration is trying to move this forward as best it can. And it always depends on how the dynamics go in Congress. But from the outside, it looks like they're really working to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if this is a question. It's kind of stopped me in my tracks when you said Governor Palin was reviewing this adaptation. So I don't, along those same lines, we've got this. Yeah. Dichotomy or the same consistency where she's looking at all these problems and spewing this vitriol about it. It is amazing. <laughs> she was very strongly behind this adaptation assessment. I didn't, I was there to facilitate. I did not go into politics. I didn't understand, but hey, I don't live up there. Um, and you do see a lot of the states are really working on adaptation. They're realizing that they're going to be affected. And they're going to be affected in lots of different ways. It was one of the sessions we had was pretty interesting when I was working with Maryland, is the state insurance commissioner came in and was talking about the problems that, the, that he's going to have with insuring within the state because the major reinsurer, reinsurers have gotten together um, the, the largest one has done their own analysis of changes in the frequency and intensity of hurricanes. And they've decided both have increased. It's not what the climatologists would sign off on, but they've, they ran their analysis, they decided. And they decided a third of it's due to climate change. The other major reinsurer is now writing policies ex specifically excluding damage due to climate change. Oh. Huh. <laughs> But people are buying that policy. And, and most of the US industry is not looking at these insurance issues. 
And he's sort of stepping back, thinking, wait till the next big hurricane and wait till a third of the policy you say I'm not paying for because we decided it's due to climate change. And industry is finally waking up to the fact that there's this big range of risks that they haven't been looking at. And it's been interesting um, from an outsider's perspective that, that many of the companies that are major emitters of greenhouse gases nine, ten years ago made it very clear they didn't want climate policy in the U.S. What's happened now is you've got 50 different states saying, I'm going to do different kinds of climate policy. They're all now going up the hill and saying to Congress and the president, we don't want 50 different regulations. We only want one. So on the one hand, they got what they asked for, and they decided they didn't like that, and it's going to be too complicated for them. So we're in, a, we're in a situation where things are changing really very quickly, and it's hard to know exactly how different bits are going to change at what speed. And again, the weather is a major factor, and people tend to forget that. Although we're talking about climate change, they forget that the weather could do things that really could change policy very fast or um, could slow down the rate that policies develop because people think, well, you know, it's really cold this winter and we don't need to do anything. Yeah, so what do you say to people who say that? I mean, there are obviously variations within a pattern that is climate change, but within that there are variations that produce cold weather. So how, how do you respond to well, that? Well, that's it. Well, I'm a scientist, so I start with explaining that climate is a 30-year average of weather. And 30-year averages, you can look at these 30-year averages, you know where things are going. There's a lot of variability around that, and we know that. Um, and it's why it's easy to, to be able to project what will happen with climate change, and they can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, because 30-year averages are a lot, a lot easier to do. So just helping people understand, actually, what these, how these numbers come about, what the basis is for how people talk about it. And we do have a lot of variability. That's what the weather is. It, the question was around the health impacts of climate change. It does depend on what country you're talking about. For the US, there, there's a requirement in the 1990 Global Change Research Act that the US conduct national assessments about every four or five years. There was a first US national assessment that came out in 2001. The Bush administration decided not to do those and instead to do synthesis and assessment products. How you can come up with a name that's a little more obtuse is beyond me. And at the time, I had braces, and I cannot say synthesis and assessment product. Um, and so there was 21 synthesis and assessment products done. You can find these on climatescience.gov, but they're all coded, and you have to know the number. And so it's sort of this game of how do you guess. So the, the health one is 4.6. So if you go to climatescience.gov and search for SAP 4.6, you can find it. If you search on health, it's really hard to find. Um, so these things are sort of kind of hidden. What we concluded for health in the US, I think the major issues are going to be air pollution. Ozone is a lung irritant. All else being equal, it's formed on clear, cloudless days. The rate at which it's formed is temperature dependent. You have more clear, cloudless days. You've got higher temperatures. You're going to have more ozone. We don't really adapt to higher ozone concentrations. It's a real problem for kids who are asthmatic, for people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a whole range of others. Very little research has been done in the US. Um, there's been some excellent research done in the Northeast showing much higher ozone concentrations and an increase in ozone-related mortality, assuming you hold emissions constant. And I should say the, the amount of funding in this area is so small that um, there was a paper that those of us who wrote the health chapter for SAP 4.6 published in, I think it was about November, maybe a little bit before. At that time, before CDC got $7 million on climate change and health, the level of funding on this issue in the US is probably a couple hundred thousand dollars. We said it was less than a million dollars a year because we couldn't come up with a precise number. Um, those of us involved have all testified to Congress. Every single time you testify, it ends up with what's going to happen in my district. 
And in a lot of nice scientific words, we say, we don't know unless you give us some money so we can really do some research. Um, so certainly ozone will be a big issue, extreme weather events, particularly heat waves, floods, um, drought in the southwest will be big issues. And going back to something I said earlier that nobody's prepared, I gave a talk a couple of years ago in Kansas City. We're on the top floor of some big hotel in the middle of Kansas City. Kansas City's got a river going through the middle of it. Someone gave a wonderful talk about what the city's doing on their mitigation plan. It's, it's a, they're really doing quite a lot. It was very interesting to hear it. They're working very hard to do the best they can with reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. And so I said, well, what are you doing on adaptation? We're not going to do anything until we get our mitigation plan well established. And then we'll start thinking about adaptation. And you look out the window, and here's the river. And on the river is the hospital. <laughs> that river is flooded before. I don't need to go into the hospital to tell you where the major equipment is. I don't need to look at the equipment to tell you it's not flood proof. And you stand there thinking, perhaps you might want to rethink the balance of your choices. Even though communities are thinking about these issues, they're not ready. The third issue that I think will be important in the US always surprises people, and it's diarrheal disease. Right now in the US, there's 350 million self-reported cases of diarrheal disease every year. That's more than one per person. Somewhere about 5 to 10% of that is probably due to salmonella. There's been a series of studies across Europe, Australia, and Canada showing that the number of cases of salmonella is clearly related to ambient temperature. Higher temperatures, you get more cases. The slope varies quite a lot from place to place, but it's a positive slope. If you think about the big outbreak in tomatoes in Florida a year or so ago, I won't say that's due to climate change, but that's exactly what it's going to look like. A field gets contaminated. Salmonella grows in nutrient-poor water. Again, the rate at which it replicates is temperature dependent. You put it in a truck. You ship it across the US. It's during the summer, because that's when we can get tomatoes. And suddenly, you've got cases in a whole range of states. And it took more than a month to identify that. It cost the tomato industry in Florida billions of dollars was a significant impact. We're going to see more of those kinds of events. I don't think we need to worry much about vector-borne diseases. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is a wonderful institution, and it's working very hard to make sure it's ready for any kind of change in the range of vector-borne diseases. By and large, the US does a great job in controlling those. So we may have things introduced. I would expect we've got the public health infrastructure to be able to handle that. The other issue we worry a lot about, and it's probably the most significant issue in developing countries, is malnutrition. We do have malnourished people in the US. There may be some impacts. It's going to be hard to tease out. By and large, we're not even looking at it in a serious manner. So I think the other are the three that I would think would be most significant here. So the question is about the birth rate. And this, this question always comes up. It's pretty interesting. If you look right now at the fertility rates, most of the developing world has decreased their fertility rates enormously within the last few years. So within just a few years, Thailand's gone from seven to just over replacement. There's lots of speculation about why that is. Um, you certainly know that in some of the countries, it's education of women. The, more, the better educated women are, the smaller families they have. The better nourished their kids are, the better their kids do. So there's been some real focus in some countries on doing that. Some of the countries, as they're slowly getting wealthier, access to inter information, television, the internet, people are seeing that they've got choices other than having seven children. Um, a couple I don't know, but somebody I know who knows them says that they go out and um, have been doing interviews, I think it was in India, where they jointly interview a couple, one of the questions about how many children you'd like to have. Then the woman goes off and interviews the wife separately. And there's this big disconnect between what they'll say. You know, together, yes, we want four or five kids. You ask the woman, she says, I want one. <laughs> 
and women are getting are having better access to be able to achieve that in many places. There's a lot of work on reproductive rights. A lot still needs to be done. So fertility rates have come down a lot. And in many places, they've come down further than further and faster than anybody would have expected. And it's, it's a good trend. Yeah. So some of the questions are about communication. You've seen that uh, uh, book that came out, I think, in August, uh, the US GRCP, right? Uh, you know, it's about 200. State of, state of the knowledge. Yeah. 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 But, but it, that, anyway, this is, a, this is about a 200 page book. It's very nicely written on impacts. But in particular, the thing, I, it's, all, it's all free on the web, too, um, is it's got a four or five page section per region in the mm -hmm. US. Because I think that's really one of the problems for the US is that the impacts are different in different places. Yes. Unlike, say, Belgium. Right. right. If you go to climatescience.gov, it's called State of the Knowledge. And State of the Knowledge, State of the, State of the, State of Knowledge, State of the Knowledge. They used to call it the Unified Synthesis Product. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 so it's climatescience.gov. And I think it's called State of the Knowledge. It's, if you go on there, it's the most recent publication that they have. And it's a synthesis of the synthesis and assessment products which in and of themselves are really fairly interesting. If you look at, if you look at some of them, the, the, inf the one on transport really focused on transport on the Gulf Coast. And it's pretty scary, the kind of stuff that they talk about in there, the risk that they have. And it, w it was interesting when we were going through, we had multiple rounds of review of the synthesis and assessment products. And the last was by the administration. And the first round from the administration suggested on the health chapter we take out everything about Hurricane Katrina. And, and the reasoning was if Hurricane Katrina had hit anywhere else, the impacts would have been different. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but but it, was a, it was a pretty interesting process because we went around and around and ended up in a face-to-face -face meeting. And this person actually thought that you could take a climate model and all you needed to understand was climate change and that would tell you what the impacts are. That you didn't need to understand the underlying vulnerability and that the underlying vulnerability in places in, some, in many cases may be more important than climate change. And it's the intersection of vulnerability with the exposure that leads to the impact. And so by the time we finished this back and forth dialogue, the person finally said, I get it. And it was great. And actually, the statements we have in there around hurricanes were significantly strengthened. We pulled in more information from the other synthesis and assessment products on hurricanes than we originally put in. So it ended up with a good dialogue, and it ended up with, with educating some people who otherwise might not have been educated. Yeah. I heard a lot of stories about this Um, and I'm just curious, you were mentioning kind of a series of different actions that local government um, can really do to support the kind of the accord itself or the outcome of that um, adaptation plans, working on your own climate action plan. Do you think that there's strength in doing that or are we kind of diverting implementation from a grander goal of having a federal climate policy or a stronger accord? The impacts of climate change are different than almost anything any sector has looked at. And I'll speak specifically for the health sector, but it's similar across all sectors. The impacts are going to be local. They're going to depend on the vulnerability. They're going to depend on the exposure. Knowing the exposure is insufficient. By and large, we don't understand the vulnerabilities. There's a large and growing amount of work done on community-based adaptation. And it's with this understanding, we've got to work with the local communities, otherwise we're not going to be effective. And that is very strong. The, the community-based adaptation has been going on for a long time. It's been funded by a whole range of people. There's other groups who've been, come in recently, like ICLE, and I can never remember what ICLE stands for, but it's a local governance group. Um, and ICLE has been working a lot on climate change. 
we have to do this. It's the only way we're going to understand and most effectively intervene. The example I like to use, I use because it's really dramatic. In the year 2000, there was massive flooding in Mozambique. Just under a million people were affected. 15,000 people were rescued from trees by helicopter. A woman gave birth in a tree, and her daughter is famous throughout Mozambique. <laughs> and you can imagine what it took Mozambique to try and get the helicopters, rescue the people. It took a long time. We're expecting more flooding with climate change. Warmer air holds more water. That's it. It's pretty simple. Warmer air holds more water. There's been a 20% increase in heavy precipitation events in the US in the last 50 years or so. So when it rains, 20%. See what's been happening the last few days? Yeah. Warmer air holds more water. It's really straightforward. It, this is nothing magic. We know that this is how it works. And so when it rains, we're getting more rain. We're getting a lot more flooding events. In 2001, I saw somebody talk about this flooding event in Mozambique in 2000. There was one slide on the health impacts. And I think everyone here could write down everything on that list except for number two. These are the major causes of morbidity and mortality. The first was the floodwaters themselves. There's the injuries. They did pretty well with, with waterborne and, and vector-borne diseases, but they did have outbreaks. It's all the kinds of stuff that you would expect. I'll give you a chance. What do you think was number, the number two cause of morbidity and mortality in this flooding event? Diarrhea. So diarrhea, famine, famine. Thirst. thirst. Any other guesses? Exposure. Hmm? Infection, erosion. erosion. It was landmines. <gasps> it was right after the Civil War. There was one million unexploded landmines. You can't see a landmine in muddy water. It was mostly children that found landmines. Again, this is really dramatic, but it really illustrates if you don't understand the local vulnerability, you don't implement the right kinds of changes. Where, where was this? Research? Mozambique. So you have to understand. And that's why these local initiatives are critically important. But that's not the only thing you have to do with adaptation. You also need the national and the international level. If I'm a mayor of a city and I'm worried about adaptation to climate change in the US, who do I call? Nobody. There's no federal program. There's no federal policy. There's nowhere to go to. The UK has a climate impacts program. It's called UK SIP. It has a fantastic website. They're funded by the UK government. They've been around for 12 years, helping communities, the insurance industry, river basins, schools, you name it. They go out. It's a very small group of six people. It's basically a little consulting group. And they go out, and the people they work with have to help pay for it. It's not just paid by the government. They provide the projections. They help you understand what those projections mean. And they help you work through the process. And they have done a huge amount of work on moving adaptation forward in the UK. Bangladesh has both national policies, and it's got strong community-based policies. And so you need to cross these scales. And when thinking about crossing these scales, it's good to keep in mind that different groups have different roles and responsibilities. I've worked with rural farmers in Africa. They have to feed their families this year. What they need to know is different from what the national agencies need to know, what FAO needs to know about what needs to be done to help the farmers. And so it's thinking about not only resorting some of what we already do, but perhaps having new structures. And there is a lot of discussion right now in the US on how to have some kind of national adaptation focal point and how to facilitate that and what's the best way to do that. And there's been hundreds of hours of discussion on that because we do absolutely need both. So earthquakes and climate change, really, it's, it, it's, it, it's indirect. It's pretty indirect. 
Um, if you think about Southern California right now, if there was an earthquake with all the saturated ground, the earthquake consequences would be worse. And it's because climate change, warmer air holds more water, you get more rain, you've got more instability in, in slopes. With an earthquake, it's gonna, but other than that, it, it's those kinds of things. And so there are, there's, are, there's these strong interplays that can take place. And one of the things that I see a lot, particularly in the health sector, is people say, well, climate change isn't the only thing. Yeah? But just because it's not the only thing doesn't mean we shouldn't work on it, that we should try and address some of these problems. And with climate change, if there's an upside to climate change, it's that you think about what happened in Haiti, they had no idea it was coming. With climate change, we have an idea that a whole range of things might be coming. The extent to which we're gonna experience impacts is up to us. And if we don't take action, then we're gonna deserve what happens. If we do take action, there's a lot that we can prevent. Do you recall yeah. the name of the website for that UK organization? It's UK SIP. It's, it's UK SIP, UK Climate Impacts Program. So it's UK SIP dot whatever it is. But if you, if you just search on UK SIP, it should come up. It's the UK Climate Impacts Program. And it's really, it's got great documents. It's got documents on risk management, on the proce processes of adaptation, all kinds of things are on there. Yeah. What, what NGOs do you think do a particularly good job of dealing with you know, the three parts of the IPCC uh, report, the science, the radiation? So the question was on the NGOs. There's a, several NGOs that try to look across more of the issues. I can't think, and I'll offend somebody, I can't think of anybody who works strongly across all of them. Um, if you look at Environmental Defense Fund, it focuses quite strongly on the mitigation. Um, NRDC looks at some impacts, some adaptation kinds of issues, some of the mitigation. Most of them understand that they've got a particular strength. Um, Oxfam does just a wonderful job working on adaptation. They've done terrific work. The Red Cross has funding in the Netherlands. They've got a Red Cross center. The Red Cross has a million volunteers, and they're going out and training them on climate change and disaster risk reduction. They've got some outstanding programs they've been working on. So you'll see different NGOs recognizing their strengths and really working on that. There's a question back in here somewhere. Yeah. The U.S. has a global change research program, which is, was set up by Congress, and it is supposed to coordinate the 13 federal agencies that have climate change work going on. It's, there's been about five National Academy panels that have all said U.S. GCRP has to be reorganized, restructured, or something because it, it has a very tiny budget. Most of the people who work there are on IPOs, so they're from a different agency and they come in just to work at USGCRP. And, and their ability to coordinate the agencies really comes down to their ability to convince people to play together well in the sandbox. They don't have any budgetary authority, and it's, 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 it's a difficult situation to be in. And the strength of, of the USGCRP program has sort of come and gone over the years. They've had some directors who've been really strong and really proactive and were just terrific, and other ones who found it more difficult to try and make that coordination happen. The agencies that all do work on climate change are taxed. USGCRP comes up with a budget, and then the different agencies all have to ante up so much money to support the office. I have, I'm a staff member at the Carnegie Institution, and at some point will probably be adjunct at one or more of the departments on the university campus. But that's still in the works, and who knows what will happen. Yeah. So I have a very hard time convincing people that climate change is real. With all that I know, and as long as I've been looking at it, I'm not a scientist. Do you have problems convincing people? And you talk to, to, to deniers and Republicans and really <laughs> 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 don't believe it. What do you say? Well, what? And can you convince them? Well, well, what I often say is the weather doesn't care whether they believe in it or not. 
our individual beliefs about climate change is not going to make a difference in terms of how much climate change we're seeing now. And different people have different perspectives on this. I only have so much time and so much energy. I do a lot of work in developing countries with people who are just desperate for help. And I would much rather focus my energies in helping those people than trying to convince somebody who doesn't want to believe. I know other people who, who make different choices, and I'm really happy for it because they work really hard to convince people. All I do is present the science and try to present it as simply as I can. You get into issues around things like the glaciers. You take an ice cube out of the refrigerator, what happens? This, <laughs> there's nothing special about much of the science here. If, if you take your coffee cup, coffee cup and fill it all the way to the brim and put it in the microwave for two minutes, what happens? It overflows. Warmer water takes more space. That's why we've got sea level rise. Most of this is not complex science. It's stuff people see every day. And in the end, this is a difficult problem. And we do have to move forward on it. We don't have to have everybody doing it. As long as we have most people working on it, we're going to be moving forward. I have, I have two daughters. One's here in the audience. The other is not far away. She couldn't come down because of all the rain. Um, the college kids are so enthusiastic around this. They've really taken up this issue. I give talks at universities, and everybody wants to work on this issue. This next generation is fantastic. They're really going to be moving this forward, and they're really organizing. Huh? They're going to be living with it. They're, well, we're living with it. But I, well, my dad doesn't care. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, that's his point of view. People who are in their 20s, they're going to be living with it. So well, my, our, our my dad's a birder. He's seen bird migration patterns change. And he, he's really clear. He understands. I'm just but, convincing people. Right. Some people don't care. Some people don't care. And there's a whole bunch of things that all of us can advocate for. That if we, There's a whole range of solutions out there that will help reduce emissions that will save all of us money. And you can get people to make changes just to save money. And you can advocate. You can do things. I've lived in Europe three different times. In Europe, you can buy appliances that actually turn off. You can buy a microwave without a clock. You can buy a, a stereo without a clock. And you can encourage the appliance manufacturers. You know, 20% of the energy used by an appliance is when it's in standby mode. Do I need five clocks in my kitchen? I don't. And I can say to the manufacturers, I don't want to pay for that. I want to have something that turns off. There's a whole list, long list of things that are, is really fairly simple. And it doesn't require big changes. And it does make a difference in people's pocketbook. And it will make a difference for the planet. Yeah. So uh, you might well look for the uh, report called Six Americas. Uh, you know that one? Yeah. There's a group at George Mason University ed, led by Ed Maybach, who has done a series of studies about US perceptions on climate change, and has identified six different groups. It's called the Six Americas. Um, and I never remember what they are, but he's got some really nice publications explaining different perspectives and thinking about how, what are the intervention points. And it's interesting, because you look across these Six Americas, there's a, there's a group that's fairly large of people who are kind of worried about climate change. And if you talk about it, it pushes them over the edge of being so worried they're, they're paralyzed. And so you have to think about different kinds of interventions with that group of people than other folks who, who don't see climate change. And to go back to something I said earlier, climate change is happening in our backyards. And I think it would be helpful what I'm hearing from all of the big networks is they want to do these shows on disastrous climate change. I'm saying, why don't you do something about climate change in your backyard? Just get people to see it. And that will start making a difference. Don't frighten people with the disasters. Those are difficult enough. Just the day-to-day -day stuff of what we're seeing that is different. And talk with, talk with people about what that means. Maybe add a comment. Uh, it's really it's getting back to this framing issue, right? So the, the climate change in your backyard is very much sort of localized and make it tangible. 
the question about framing around health. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded that last summer, I think it was in August, the United States Department of Defense, or the Joint Chiefs, released this report that the number one threat for our security, right, so you can speak to sort of the guns and God folks, <laughs> is climate change. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not Al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. right? It's politically the topic that's on your minds. But it's a, it's a report that I saw written up in the New York Times, I think, in August. I haven't actually read the report, but my concern is around say, water issues and drought causing further civil war and unrest and hot spots all over. It. It, it, so like framing this subject in a language that, that, that speaks to the audience's uh, bias. And then other than that, maybe talk to different people. <laughs> <laughs> or choose different topics. Yeah, there, there's a group called the Center for a New American Security, CNAS. And a year and a half, half ago, they held war games. And if you go to CNAS website, I think it's cnas.org. Um, and the war games were pretty interesting. They had a broad range of political people present. They had a few scientists present. The premise was it was 2015. We actually had the 2012 Copenhagen Agreement. Um, and we had the agreement. Countries have signed on to it. Bad stuff continues to happen. And so the Secretary General of the UN, John Podesta, called together the major emitters, um, the US, Europe, China, and India, to do further negotiations. Most of the negotiate, there's three areas we negotiated on. Three were on adaptation, one was on mitigation. And it was interesting going through the briefing binders, which are available online as well. The bad stuff included Category 5 hurricane hitting Miami. There's projections that crop yields in sub-Saharan Africa can fall 30 to 50% within a few decades. That would put millions of Africans on the move trying to get into Europe. And they do migration and immigration almost as well as we do. Um, the other was a massive event in Bangladesh with 200,000 Bangladeshis on the Indian border. And these are serious military people talking about what will we do. And what kinds of, and the question really in the war games is what can we put in place now so that if those things happened, we would have a sensible response and we wouldn't be running around saying, what do we do? And there's a number of other groups who've been working on these kinds of issues. Some of these are classified. The CNS one is not, and it's, they've got several, besides that, they've got a document they called the Age of Consequences. They've got several different things on their website that is available for anybody to use. What does it stand for, CNAS? The Center for a New American Security. So the question's on the, the clean development mechanism. And I have to say, I know fairly little about this. One of the things that you find when you work in climate change, it's a huge issue. And um, there's a statement somebody made a long time ago about the first President Bush, with some statement that his knowledge was a mile wide and an inch deep. And I thought this was pretty funny, and I kept repeating it until one day I realized, in fact, I work in climate change, and it's fairly similar, actually. <laughs> I know a little bit about a lot of things. The CDM, I know, has had real problems getting up and running. Um, I understand that they've made progress in resolving some of those issues. In principle, it's a great idea. In practice, they're having trouble trying to make it work. But again, my understanding is that it has been improving. And people are developing more confidence in the ability of the CDM. Well, it's 9 o'clock. You guys didn't take a break. You've been absolutely terrific. I really appreciate all of the good questions. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.